Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer, and my guest this week is John Burney. Welcome, John. Thank you. Nice yeah. to meet you. Yeah, I was going to interview John last summer, and then he had to have eye surgery. He's had all kinds of eye karma, and uh, but uh, so we had to reschedule, and here we are. And both last summer, uh, I listened to quite a few hours of your satsangs, and also now in the last week, I've listened to about eight hours of your podcasts. Just mm. I, I always do that in preparation for the interview I'm about to do in my trusty iPod while I ride my bike and brush my teeth and <laughs> all kinds of things. Uh, so uh, it, it's been enjoyable. You know, and one thing that's kind of stood out for me as I was listening is a lot of the people who sit with you are really cooking. You know what I mean? I mean, I don't know if you attract people who are just cooking or else you get them cooking, but there's, it's like 75% of the people are either in tears or they're breathing heavy or, you know, something really intense is going on for them uh, while they're sitting with you there in the satsang. Um, how do you explain that? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, a lot of energy is moving. Uh huh. And it's a powerful environment. And so um, the way I usually talk about it is that the um, the presence or that fundamental nature that we are when it's really um, opened to and realized can actually facilitate a an emergence of a healing process or a transformative process yeah. in the body, mind, and the heart and so forth. So generally when people are coming up, they're in a process usually that they're, they have been cooking as you say, mm -hmm. as I often say too. So are most of the people who come up and, uh, I, I, well, uh, just for the be benefit of the audience, um, generally it sounds like John has a gathering and there might be 20, 30 people in the, in the room and then one at a time people will come up on the stage and s sit with you in, a, in an adjacent chair and you'll have a little dialogue. And, but, you know, what I'm alluding to is that very often these people by the, within a minute or two of that they're they're crying or <laughs> or they're going through some oh my god you know, some heavy breathing thing or something so i'm just cu curious i mean it, uh, i've seen this kind of phenomenon before of course and others who are on sort of a spiritual path have seen it but it seems to be characteristic almost of of your satsangs um, there's a lot of I, I would say very simply you know um there's a lot of energy happening there yeah it's a pretty powerful field a pretty powerful working field if you want to use that term mm -hmm. um, and you know I don't see any difference between our fundamental nature and just pure energy right so there's really an alignment with that and I think it's clearly has a very powerful effect on people very and, and a powerful healing and transformative effect mm -hmm. so I don't really see the spiritual process any different than the healing process they're really identical in my own experience and in others so that's probably, you'd have yeah. to be there. Or you might even feel it now. I mean, and people will tell me, even on the podcast, <clears throat> that when they're really tuning in and listening deeply, mm -hmm. that they can feel the force of that energy, which is pretty far out, really, if you think about it. Like, how, do, how is that possible? But I work, and I work with people around the world on Skype, mm -hmm. and they're very aware also of, what, of this connection that we are. So I think it goes beyond our rational minds, you know, conceptual ability to, you know, explain what that is. It's yeah. really part of that mystery which we're all, you know, either tapping into or hoping to tap into. Yeah. The way I understand it is that, and maybe maybe the opposite of this could also be true, but it's not so much that something is being transmitted from A to B, but rather there's an, an alignment or attunement that takes place that enables you know, both to get, to, to enables the one to sort of get on the same wavelength as the other and thereby, yeah. thereby to experience much, uh, a much greater upsurge of, uh, of energy than they ordinarily might. I think that's right. I think that's exactly right. We really, it's almost like a tuning fork in that your own resonant field starts to vibrate on that frequency. Yeah. And in that there's a kind of connection, a communication, uh, uh, so-called transmission, um, People often think of transmission like from point A to point B, but I don't really think that's how it works. Yeah, <laughs> it can seem like that. Right, it right. It can really feel like that. It can that can be the that can be the experiential sense of it, but uh, I think it's much more of a mutual interconnected flow that's actually always here, and yeah. we just become we realize that. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? 
And I think the metaphors help, actually. I mean, with tuning forks, you can put one near the other, and the, and the other starts to vibrate uh, if yeah. it's in, because of that sort of affinity with the, with the one that's already vibrating. Or like logs, for instance. You put one log next to a log that's already burning brightly, and that log begins to ignite. And, 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 but it does so by virtue of its own inherent chemistry. And it's not like fire is going from A to B, but there's something that just sort of catalyzes the ignition of the, the, the non-burning log. There's a term for it called bioentrainment, oh. and they've done studies with it, even with like uh, grandfather clocks, where the pendulums are swinging in different rates. Mm -hmm. If they're next to each other, eventually they'll synchronize and they'll swing the same. I'll be darned. Yeah, and they've done stuff even with women, for instance, who are living. Uh, they found uh, that their periods will synchronize if they're living in the same uh, place. So it's right. very interesting. There's a kind of synchronization that happens, or even blood vessels. I think they've like if you if one blood vessel sort of going like this, another one's going like that. When they get close, they actually start to go together. I yeah. actually posted a video that somebody sent me the other day about swallows. Was it? Or oh murmuration. yeah. Oh murmuration. I got that one too. Yeah, and I think that's another example of the same thing where we see this phenomenal interconnection of what looks like a bunch of separate entities mm -hmm. actually operating clearly connected. Yeah. And I think we are like that even though we don't even know it. Hmm. That we're all sort of blood vessels in some giant body. <laughs> I like that. Yeah, I like that. And it's kind of fun to think about it in terms of the larger society as well, you know, not just sort of this teacher with this one student, but what may be happening among all seven billion of us as as consciousness sort of gets enlivened. Yeah, clearly that's happening. More and more people and more and more young people. I'm just amazed at the young people who are showing up in their teens, mm -hmm. even who have already awake. And, uh, you know, they still have their life to figure out. They still have to mature. Yeah. You know, but it's they have a different perspective because of that ability to see deeply. And I think it's quite extraordinary. Yeah, it's cool. I mean, you, you and I are about the same age almost. I think you're a few years younger. I'm 62, but, you know, we so we went through the 50s and then the 60s and so on, you know, and there was definitely a zeitgeist in each of those decades, you know, but the, now what's happening is uh, it's kind of inspiring to see with this mass kind of enlivenment or awakening taking place. Yeah, it's great. I love it. It's wonderful. I mean, there was a time where when I had my first awakening, I, I didn't know what even happened to me then. I was 16. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't talk to anybody, you know, nobody or right. very few people. Not until I was 20 did I find out what had happened to me. And then, mm. you know, even then, you know, and now it's very different. I mean, that was a long time ago. But now it's like there's so many people yeah. who are sharing this experience, sharing this realization and really find we're all finding our way with it. Mm -hmm. And you've probably heard of the 100th monkey phenomenon, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> For those who haven't, it was this um, experiment. It was, that, you know, it was it was actually debunked. it was debunked. Was there it? Was some, I think, oh well. Yeah, there was. Some, they it was just, a nice I story anyway. <laughs> it, was, it was good. I know that they were using that in the. Uh, I think in the TM, uh, when, when everybody, when a lot of people were learning meditation with right, uh, transcendental right. meditation, doing mm -hmm. mantra, mm -hmm. and thousands and thousands of people were doing that. They they had a feeling like if enough people did it, it would sort of change the consciousness. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's a great intention. Who knows? Yeah, right? yeah. I mean, maybe. Oh, I, that's my background, actually. I've been in groups of 8,000 people meditating together, and it was palpable. I mean, boy, the energy in that room. Yeah. How bad. <laughs> it is pal palpable. Yeah. And, of course, the claim was that it was actually influencing the stock market and the politicians and all that stuff, and that, to me, is speculative, but um, they, you know, there's a lot of scientists who took it seriously. Who knows? Yeah, I mean, who knows? I, do, we, do we really know what's affecting what? I mean, I think that's ultimately, I think when we really enter into this mystery more and more, we really, we really find that we don't know, and yet we're completely aligned with it. Yeah. So it's not about something. It's really more about discovering, continually discovering. Uh, I think that's, that's a whole different attitude to have. Yeah, I like that attitude. Um, well, you alluded to an awakening that you had when you were 16. If you don't mind, let's let's go back a bit and kind of trace <laughs> trace your odyssey. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I had a the psychic when I was around 20, a wonderful psychic named Ann Armstrong, told me that I had had many lifetimes mm -hmm. as a monk. Apparently, I mean, I don't know. I don't mm -hmm. remember. I don't have an access to that if that's true. But um, <clears throat> and she said that I knew how to set myself up at an early age to have the experience that happened at 16 because clearly there was nothing in my childhood that would have 
um, guided me to that, except I did have a very strong questioning uh, function. Uh -huh. You know, I remember being four years old, looking up at the stars, going, "What's happening? What is this?" You know, yeah. Wondering, and and then at eleven, I found myself arguing with the Sunday school teacher about the existence of God, and I wasn't buying it. <laughs> you know, I was more had I know I was more had a scientific sort of science approach. You know, like I was very much of an empiricist, mm -hmm. and you know, seeing is believing kind of thing. Right. And so I told my mother I wasn't going to Sunday school anymore. I was too busy practicing the violin. And I kind of became an agnostic at 11 mm. years old, and and felt that my friends and all their respective religions were being brainwashed, basically. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was kind of, I thought, well, I, why should I just believe this without having an experience? That's kind of how it was. Yeah. But by the time I was 16, I was really questioning, you know, it was 1969. Mm -hmm. <clears> there <throat> was a lot going on then. And here I was in, you know, San Francisco area, and and the peace movement, and, and just a lot of, there was a lot happening. Um, I really was questioning of life, I was really, questioning, um, and and what that questioning brought forth was a kind of inner search mm -hmm. that wasn't related to anything I was reading or anybody I was talking to, and um, I think it went on for about four months, and there were various points along the way where there were various kind of insights, I guess, or revelations, and I guess the first question I really had was, is there some kind of creative force in the universe? Because I was, you know, I was very science-oriented and physics and so forth and laws mm -hmm. of gravity, things like that. And I was wondering if there's some kind of force like a gravity produced that actually, you know, evoked life, evoked matter. And that was the first kind of inner question that was really cooking. And the first insight that came was, um, well, of course there's some kind of creative force because there's all this stuff, right? There's trees and animals and people and planets and so then for some reason or another it became profoundly important for me to find out what this was find out what this force was it became actually the most important thing to me and because <clears throat> I didn't know why I was working so hard you know I was a straight-A student I was a concert violinist I was gonna go to Stanford medical school and I was you know thinking what am I doing this you know I was questioning mm. you know what am I doing and uh, so the next insight that came was, of course, I can discover what this is because I'm a part of it. Yeah, yeah. So somehow or other, I came up with a plan, which was to sit down. I had a, bean, a big furry beanbag chair, and I was going to sit down in the chair, and I was going to the wall, and I wasn't going to move until I discovered it. I was going to wait till my parents went to bed. And, I mean, ironically, I was basically doing very concentrated meditation practice, didn't even know what meditation was. Mm -hmm. And I, they went to bed, and I sat down in the beanbag, and I stared at the wall, and, um, you know, my arm itched, and I wouldn't scratch it, and my mind would wander, I wouldn't let it wander, and I, I knew a little bit about breathing from acting, because I'd done mm -hmm. some acting in high school. And things started happening, there was a kind of something started happening which really blew my mind. It was the, the walls started to, um, almost like they were breathing. Mm. They were almost like a wave undulation. And not only that, I could feel it. I could feel this. And not only that, there was kind of a radiant light coming from it. I could feel that. And so I had the sense that I was on the, going in the right direction. Mm. <laughs> and I went with it and it got stronger and stronger and more and more powerful. Mm -hmm. And um, Eventually, it became so intense, it became terrifying. Mm. It was almost as if, uh, the way I described it then was just like I was in a race car, and, and the pedal was stuck to the, to Floor. the floorboard, mm. and, and it was going faster and faster and faster, and I was going to go off an abyss. I was going to go off the edge of a cliff. And I knew that I had to. Because mm. I really felt like I, I had to sit there until I discovered this. It was, more, it was as important as being alive for me. I don't know why, but that's, that's the way it was. <clears throat> and this voice, believe it or not, came to me and said, just stay with your breathing. Hmm. It was clearly out of my head, and it was like, wow. <laughs> far. So I did, and the, you know, the movements got stronger, the light was incredibly bright, feeling was incredibly strong, and I was you know, terrified, and then there was like an explosion. Hmm. And there was no more room, and there was no more me, and there was 
all there was was the way I described it was like I'd become the sun. Mm. And it felt the feeling, I guess, was like a million times orgasm. Hmm. And I don't know how long consciousness was in that state or whatever it was, but <clears throat> awareness came back into the body and the room, and it's like the whole room was being imploded through me and then exploded out of me, and I felt like I was being ripped apart. It was the, the, the movement, this, this kind of ripping apart thing was like in sync with the breathing. And I started shaking and crying, and I got up to get a blanket to cover myself, and I looked at the clock, and I'd been there for like three hours. Hmm. And the thing that was amazing, Rick, was that after this experience, life had meaning. Before it, I didn't have a meaning. I looked back at my past. I thought, what? everything seemed disjointed. Like, what is this all mean about? And everything forward didn't have a sense of what. And after that, everything felt connected. There were felt complete meaning of everything that had happened and a sense of guidance and trajectory into the so-called future. And ever since then, I could see and feel what I called the light. And now, as I found out, and not until I met my first main teacher, Jean Klein, mm -hmm. did I realize that he was coming from that place that I had clearly opened to at that age. So That's impressive. Boy, when I was that age, I was just goofing around, you know, <laughs> <laughs> playing drums, chasing girls, getting drunk, you know. <laughs> Here you are, a straight-A student and a concert violinist. That's well, I was, I was going to the Fillmore, and I was, you know, don't worry, I was, I was definitely... Uh, uh, I wasn't like cloistered or anything, yeah. but um, yeah, but there was this inner process that clearly was pretty strong. And then I ended up becoming, you know, a Buddhist monk. I didn't go to medical school. I just, I, I went to college for a while and then dropped out and ended up realizing that I had to follow what would have happened to me. Yeah. And that's what led me to many years of, you know, Buddhist practice, Zen and Vipassana, and then mm -hmm. with uh, Jean Klein and the teachers that I was with. Did you have like uh, more experiences like that, or was it just that one big one? And then after that, you kind of had to do your pay your dues and and you know get into a practice and and work along more slowly. That's a good question. You know, I think that there was you know I think what I realized after that experience, once I started understanding what had happened, was that there was a lot of sort of I don't know there was a lot of healing that this body mind through, mm -hmm. and so I became involved in the healing arts, act, not only to, as a recipient, but also as a practitioner. And so there was kind of a dual development of both um, a kind of spiritual path and also a healing path. And I began to see that they really were not separate. I like your emphasis on that, actually, because to my way of thinking, you know, the body is the temple of the soul. It's, it's like a, the instrument through which if we are to live awakening or spirituality or whatever we want to call it uh, it's through this body mind structure and if you try if you trash that your, your your experience isn't going to be so clear if you fine tune it and you know purify it in various ways it's probably going to be more clear I mean there's that, you know that I, not a one-to-one -one correlation I mean you hear stories of alcoholics kind of having big sudden awakenings and everything changes despite what they've been doing to their nervous systems but as a general rule it seems to apply you know, also to answer your other question was that, yes, there have been many experiences along the way. Uh, there have been various, what I would call, very significant changes that had mm -hmm. happened. That was the first one. That was yeah. the big one. But then there was one that happened with Jean Klein that I think was what I would call the end of seeking, mm -hmm. where there was a 180-degree shift in my understanding of so-called spiritual practice, where prior to that, there was this effort to be conscious. Mm. I had to effort to be conscious, and after that, it was effortless to be conscious, to be mm. connected in the presence. Right. And it felt at that moment that my personal life, my professional life, and my spiritual life became one thing. Mm -hmm. So that was another major significant shift. And then that was probably in the late 80s. Hmm. And then in the mid-90s... So, so you had actually, yeah. you'd gone through your whole Zen monk phase, and then you were with Jean Klein, so we're talking like you know, a couple of decades before this shift where you had stopped seeking well, from 69 was yeah almost 20 years probably yeah 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 cause i didn't understand really i mean i didn't have anybody who was mirroring that in the teachers that i had weren't what i i mean they uh, i don't know i mean i, I don't want to say much about that but i think that it wasn't until i met jean klein uh did i realize what 
I had been missing, I guess, in terms of feedback and, yeah. and kind of a resonant clarity. Um, <clears throat> but then when I was with uh, Robert Adams um, in mid '90s, um, I, there was another another major shift happened. I would say, which is I would call the end of fear, hmm. which it it was like there was a kind of you know being connected in to this present is one thing, but many people, I see this all the time in my groups uh, and gatherings and privately, that um, people can access, but there's a kind of full letting go or something that, that maybe quite hasn't happened yet, yeah. and a kind of contraction or a fear that arises, and I, and I had that many, many times, and that seemed to, that finished with uh, when I was with Robert. Hmm. And that was very profound, very profound change, I'd say. Let's uh, let's probe into both of those things a little bit more. So there was the end of seeking transition with Jean Klein, and uh, you said that all the sort of the different aspects of your life all kind of came together at that point. Um, and you know, as a lot of teachers these days are all saying to their students, "So oh, just stop seeking." Um, to to me that seems yeah. To me that seems a little <laughs> premature, perhaps. It's a, it's like the guy on the mountaintop shouting down, "Okay, stop climbing!" You know, <laughs> um, you're gonna stop when seeking stops naturally when finding occurs. It seems to me you don't have to try to stop seeking. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and I think that's why in Zen they say, "If you have it, we'll give it to you. If you don't have it, we'll take it away." Because <laughs> Otherwise, okay, stop seeking. Well, that's going to become another seeking, isn't it? Yeah, or just a mood or an attitude. And I mean, if they, if they if people really took that seriously, they'd stop coming to the meetings at which they're being told to stop seeking. <laughs> Are the teachers even there? Yeah. <laughs> um, and in my own in my own kind of uh, assessment of that, my own experience, it seems to me that I, I understand what what is meant by stop seeking. It's like when a certain level of fulfillment has been established there's no longer that yearning craving you know oh god, oh god I gotta have it or I'll die sort of feeling uh, there's a con uh, solid as a rock contentment but it doesn't mean you lose interest in, in all these sorts of things or you know I mean you, know, you can be totally fascinated and listening and writing and talking and as you do professionally really uh, well, I think that yeah I think there's you realize you are that I mean it's yeah. that simple the end of seeking is you realize you are that and whether or not you're always in some blissful state of samadhi isn't the point. I mean, some people might be, okay, whatever. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, it isn't, it's not a problem anymore. It isn't, it isn't something, it's, it's, once you know you are that profoundly, it isn't an intellectual knowing. It's right. completely it's experiential in the knowing. Bones. Yeah. That's what I would refer to as the, in my own experience, I refer to that as the end of seeking. Yeah. And also, I would, would you agree that the end of seeking... I was quite an achiever, as you probably could Yeah, know. right. And so quite being a meditator, I was a hardcore meditator. You know, I was... Medi you know, I was it, everything I did was, you know, it was, uh, as I used to jokingly say, I used to make a type A look catatonic. So, <laughs> that's a meditator. <laughs> yeah. Kind, kind of like Adyashanti carrying his bicycle racing over into uh, his meditation practice. Right. <laughs> um, and I, would you also agree that stop seeking doesn't necessarily mean st and certainly doesn't mean stop growing it's not like you've reached the sort of penultimate you know state of human development there there's yeah, still going to be that's i think a complete that, i mean i think that's a real uh, i think i think the reality is that when you really become aligned with this creative life force that we really are then you're nothing but discovering it's different than seeking yeah yeah you're constantly discovering you're part of the creative flow Mm. And so every moment is a moment of discovery. And yeah. so it's not about it's not about like now you've attained something because a lot of the language even in at least in terms of the limitation of language is 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 I think it's it's, it's almost like it sounds like you've attained something. It kind but of objectifies something which is really very subjective it seems to me. My my experience is that everything is brand new every moment. Ah, Completely nice. So each moment of awareness is absolutely a new, it, every revelation is constantly happening. Yeah, that's great. And then people don't feel so freaked out when they're like caught in a, what I call an ego flare up <laughs> or some yeah. rea old reactive pattern gets activated or some deep wounding or some deep, um, what can I say? Uh, um, Constriction. Maybe, some, maybe or some maybe 
you know, early, early wounding that finally comes to the surface and is ready to be healed. Because that certainly can happen if one is truly open. Yeah, no, well, not, good, good point. I mean, what you're, what you're saying is that that openness can actually catalyze a, a, a greater um, purging or unfoldment or resolution or coming to the surface of buried stuff, right? Absolutely. Well, that's where we started the conversation. That's exactly what happens in, yep. in the so-called work that I'm doing. That's exactly what's happening. Yeah. And I think many people are really needing the support of that because, you know, they go to groups, they go to events, which are kind of large events often, and they don't get the they don't get the one-on-one -on -one attention that they very well may be ready uh, to benefit from. I was very lucky that I had that, and uh, yeah. with all my teachers, pretty close relationship. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I think that there's a there's definitely a place for that. Not everybody needs that, but I think that often at a certain stage it can become almost essential. I would say. Yeah, which is why it's nice, I think, that there's so many teachers around these days. And, you know, there are differing levels of effectiveness, perhaps, and clarity and, and so on. But people gravitate to whoever is going to be effective for them. And if, if they're no longer effective, they'll move on to somebody else. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So it's really cool that you got to hang out with um, Jean Klein and Robert Adams. And, I mean, these are, you know, some of the real heavy hitters of... Uh, <laughs> You know, recent spiritual scene. And yeah, I, don't, I don't mean that in a trendy, faddish kind no, of sense. I mean no, these guys were. Yeah. I mean, for me, I wasn't. I wasn't really interested in meeting. T I wasn't somebody who was looking for teachers ever. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I was. I, I was mostly dragged to these people. I mean, I didn't even want to go and meet them uh. actually. And then things happened, and I couldn't deny it. So, that's more how it worked for me. Yeah. <laughs> I guess because it's my trajectory has been so long that I just had a, you know, the opportunities just sort of came along the way. Mm -hmm. um, so, yes, I'm very grateful, deeply, profoundly grateful. Yeah. Who's that gentleman whose picture is over your left shoulder there? That's Robert Adams. Oh, is that Robert? Okay. Yeah. I didn't know yeah. what he looked like. <laughs> okay. That's Robert. Cool. So, now... During the Robert Adams phase, you said you had a second awakening. What was that again? Or a second major shift? Yeah, that was what I'd call the end of fear. The end, end of, of fear, fear of being yeah. the light, I guess, mm -hmm. of being fully kind of that. Hmm. Uh, there wasn't any, I mean, I think there's, I don't know, that's how I would describe it. You know, mm -hmm. that, was, that was my own experience. It used to be a kind of opening into awareness that would then kind of stop mm -hmm. a little bit. And because there was a fear of complete loss of, something and uh, that that seemed to have just completely ended at that point huh was that during like a meditative practice you would hit a, a fear blockage and and kind of re, re, retract from that or was it just 24 7 there was you were sort of like no. holding no no it only happened once in a while when there would be a certain amplification of awareness mm. when it got very 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 intense there would mm. be some holding back a little bit of holding back I would say that's that finished. That finished. Hmm. That whatever that holding back was stopped holding. Back. So that just kind of dissolved with Robert yeah. Adams. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. so, what practical um, impact did that have on your life? <laughs> <laughs> Anything anyone would notice? You know, just who well, happened I, to know you well? Yeah, I would say that. Um, hmm. Well, I think it took me about a year and a half to integrate that, and I mm -hmm. was in a very altered place for probably six months. Hmm. But then you know you get you get you get reorganized in a way and things become ordinary. Um, so I can't really. Yeah, Were you I, able to function normally oh, during yeah, that during I, that year I, and a half? You hold I down was, a job or whatever. I, but quite honestly, all I wanted to do at the time was basically just wander. <laughs> I mean, I yeah. totally understood the sort of wandering sadhu yeah. reality. I had. I, I mean, I was just in profound bliss for all the time. Mm. And it was very intense, and it was fine. I could function, but it was. I really just wanted to wander, or just you know, just sit around or wander. And but I knew enough to kind of stay grounded in so-called reality and keep mm -hmm. functioning. So you didn't <laughs> you didn't fulfill that desire to wander, and <laughs> I didn't need to. Mm. But there was there was. I could see the impulse to do that. I could not the impulse, but I could see that that could be a natural outcome of that. Kind of uh, shift. Yeah. 
in a way, I think wandering can serve a purpose at a certain stage because it can prov if you're at a stage where you need to sort of not get attached to anything, it can kind of keep, of course you can get attached to wandering, but it can, uh, letting the dogs in and out, it can uh, create a certain freedom on a relative level, don't you think? Just sort of always something new, something new, something new. It, it, I don't know. For yeah, me, I, I, I went through a phase like that. That's why I'm saying yeah. it. I, don't, I just don't think in our culture being homeless works that well. <laughs> um, I mean, not to put that, I'm not to be pejorative in any way, but I mean, I think in India it might be easier to be homeless. Yeah. And to have a kind of a lifestyle where you're just wandering around and, you right. know, and you're a beggar or whatever. I mean, I can, mm -hmm. I, I think in other cultures and per, probably other climate zones, <laughs> yeah. it's probably easier to kind of do that one. And it wasn't like an identity or anything like that. It wasn't like it, it just it was just this it was obvious that that could happen. Right. That was kind of Okay. So mid nineties, Robert Adams, end of fear. Um so what what was next? Oh, I don't know, just the next thing, you know, I mean uh, just living life going on. Mm -hmm. Um it's I, think, I saw a I, picture of you and Adya Shanti kind of arm in arm. Did, did yeah, you become a student of his at one point? Or? We became close. Uh -huh. And uh, we are close, actually. Mm -hmm. And uh, he actually sort of formally asked me to teach, which was nice. Mm. And uh, so we've had a connection for, I don't know how long, 10 years now, something mm. like that. Um, yeah, he was wonderful. He had a wonderful uh, impact with me and and really helped me in a way, in a very some really important, subtle ways there. And, and uh, so, yeah, we're... Yeah, mm -hmm. he came here to my town last April and had. Oh, some, nice! Yeah, kind of set it up for him to come. Oh, great! How nice! Yeah, it was really nice. That's how I got to interview him because I was able to sort of pin him down at lunch and say, "How'd you like to do this?" He couldn't say no. <laughs> um, so, can you elaborate on those subtle ways that uh, it's kind of it'd be interesting to sort of delve into that? And, and, you know, I mean, because many people think, all right, you realize, you know, you're awake. What more do you need to do? Uh, but, you know, you're kind of alluding to subtle fine tunings that take place and that maybe even are taking place now for you. I don't know. Yeah, I think I don't have any, I don't, I mean, I'm, I don't, I don't hold up some, you know, what? S sign. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I don't, do, does anybody know where we really are at any time, actually? I mean, I think the more we align with, that which we are, the less we really know. Yeah, and I like that. A, you know, and so for me, you know, I sometimes some very deep material I found out, you know, that this, um, I had very, I had very early birth trauma, and uh, I think some of that still is mm. being healed. I think to a great, to a large degree, it has been, and it's pretty, I'm pretty free of it. But I think some of that was still coming up, and it was very deeply buried in the nervous system. And I've even seen this with. Very, so I don't want to mention any names, but mm -hmm. I've seen this with some very celebrated teachers where, mm -hmm. you know, given certain circumstances, aspects of their sort of human conditioning were brought to the foreground and they, you know, and people were often shocked because they, I think there was a naive belief that somehow people become perfect. Yeah. Like they're somehow like purified or sanitized or something like that. Mm -hmm. And I think many, many people are very grateful to hear or hear me be honest about that it's okay to be a human being and that you don't have to be perfect and there may be parts that are still broken, unhealed, unseen, unfelt, and they may come up and you'll allow them to heal. What's the problem? Yeah. You know, does that mean that you're somehow, you know, not spiritual or something? You know, you know what you know what I wanted to share with you? Somebody who really inspired me when I was quite young was Sri Aurobindo. Ah. And he, you know, founded um founded was it in Pond, uh, yeah, Pondicherry. Pondicherry, India, mm -hmm. um, and he wrote The Life Divine, mm -hmm. and which was quite a major work, and I didn't read, the, couldn't, I mean, I would just read one line and it would be enough for a month, basically. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but what I loved about what he said was, one of the things he said was, he, he really inspired me to find out how to live this sort of so-called spiritual life in the midst of ordinary reality, mm -hmm. not just by being a monk and having robes and shaved head and living that lifestyle, even though that was my lifestyle for a while, and it might very well be very valid for a whole life, depending on one's uh, what's right for someone. Mm -hmm. In any case, I think what he said, though, that was so powerful, he said, you know, the greater the sinner, the greater the saint. And the way he described it was that if you start 
with this much experience in your life, let's mm -hmm. say one inch base of a triangle, right? Mm -hmm. And you go up to the point up here. When you get up here at the pinnacle, try to stay in the camera. <laughs> that's all right. Uh, you have a very thin, little, tall triangle. And, yeah. she's, and he says, that's how much you can help people. That's mm. where you can help him. He says, but if you start way out here, you have a bigger life experience, right? The greater the center, right? Mm -hmm. Then when you get up here, it may take a little longer, whatever, but yeah. then you have this that you can offer. And I thought, now, isn't that great? I mean, that's like, not only is that a deep understanding of our humanity, but it's a great understanding of the compassion of forgiveness and that, and of, of our condition, whatever mm -hmm. it is, no matter how horrific it is. And I think that there's value, but most people need to be heard. They need they need their humanity to be heard and to seen and felt in a way that doesn't ha that comes from that presence. That is that space of unconditional, non-judgmental awareness. And that's certainly what's happening in, in my group. It's why people are, like you were describing, having healing because mm -hmm. the light heals. And so um, it really and like you say, it's really the alignment with ourself. It's really coming back into balance. So I think that it's, you know, I think most people that I know are, I think people grow much more rapidly, so-called spiritually, when they don't try to deny their humanity. I've yeah. seen nothing but more repression and more kind of, I, I think the spiritual identity is probably the hardest identity to actually become free of. Hmm. Yeah, interesting. When I, w I was up at the Science and Non-Duality Conference in San Rafael a few weeks ago, and I was in one of the sessions there was a panel discussion among three or four different well-known spiritual teachers and somebody in the audience said can can any of you say anything to us which would make you more human you know can you can you say something which can enable us to relate to you as human beings right. and uh which is funny because one of the people was Kenny Johnson who spent half his life in prison and that seemed human enough to me but um I understood the lady's point, you know, because there's this tendency to put spiritual teachers on a pedestal and to think that, you know, they don't have all the same bodily functions that we mortals do. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Well, yeah, and I think that even putting anybody up on a pedestal is, is already um, uh, right. It's 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 potentially, <laughs> you know, that if if that projection is still going on, that's going to be an obstacle. Yeah. For both that, the teacher and the student, you I, know, I mean, total, how, 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 can, you can't think of too many contemporary teachers who haven't fallen off their pedestal at one time or another. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think it would be a lot more helpful for people just to know that, that you know, I, I like what Jean Klein said, there, you know, there's any, when there's no one taking themselves to be a teacher mm. and no one taking themselves to be a student, then teaching is taking place. Hmm. That I don't have any identity of being a teacher. I know that that's the projection that's going on out there, and I know I'm in that so-called role, but personally, I do not have that perception at all. Hmm. What do you perceive? I'm just right here. Yeah. This is what's happening, mm -hmm. and I'm available. Availability is here. There's openness. Yeah. There's interaction. But there isn't some sense of I'm doing it or I'm a healer or I'm a spiritual teacher. I mean, I know that those people have those beliefs about me, but I don't. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, no, I see what That's, you mean. It's not functioning. And it would seem to me... Um, How could it be? Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, I imagine the whole... You're learning as much as they are if, if we want to speak to students, you know? Absolutely. <laughs> my te you're my teacher. Yeah. This is my I, teacher right now. This is where I'm... This is how I'm finding my way. It's like when I had that awakening at 16, what happened then was something started guiding me, and it hasn't stopped. Mm. And, I'm, and, I, and I'm willing to question, I'm willing to change my frame of mind and my attitude about things, so I'm not stuck in some particular belief. Otherwise, I never would have left the monastery. Yeah. In fact, when I did leave the monastery, I was shocked how narrow my thinking had become. Huh. You live in a community, and you can become like almost uh, inbred in a way and I, I was I had become very narrow-minded I don't think it was helpful no I agree um, I mean as I mentioned I was in the TM movement for many years and it has its monastic component which I was a part of and you know we would go on these long courses in India or Switzerland or someplace and be meditating six eight ten hours a day for six months at a time and uh, but and it, you know it was, and it was segregated men's group ladies group and 
you could really get uh, deeply entrenched in your idiosyncrasies. It's like there was nothing to kind of bounce you out of it. Um, and, you know, I mean, even now you go to a, a monastery or even a Catholic uh, monastery place and you see some very, very sincere, sweet, but idiosyncratic people who have become kind of deeply entrenched in a, in a way of thinking that they haven't had the opportunity to kind of break out of because they've, they've been cloistered like that. Yeah, well, I think we naturally, no matter what, even whether it's religious or not religious, we do we tend to get institutionalized as members of a group. It just happens. I think it's just part of human psychology. I mean, I'm not a, I'm not an expert in that, but you know, I think that it's um, and clearly even in those in those environments, there are people who become free mm -hmm. and live within the confines of those structures, and yet can be a very you know um, beautiful force for change and healing. Um, I loved what Robert Aiken, Robert Aiken was a Zen teacher that I had a relation, that I had a friendship with many, many years ago, and he, um, I loved what he said uh, referring to Zazen, which is, you know, Zen meditation, he said, um, enlightenment <clears throat> is an accident, but Zazen makes you accident prone. Oh, <laughs> I, I've often used that quote, but I didn't know where it came from. I thought it was, and, uh, I forget who I thought it was from, but that's, I love that, yeah. Yeah, and, I, and then I usually add at the end. Maybe. Yeah, right. <laughs> Maybe it makes you accident from. Maybe not. Yeah. <laughs> no guarantee. Uh. <laughs> but I think a lot of times people today, I'm finding even now, where people have had awakenings, mm -hmm. very powerful awakenings. They go to satsang, whatever, there's a lot of energy, a lot of presence. They open up, and then they don't know how to, they're actually decompensated. They're, they're actually becoming destabilized, and they're now having to kind of backtrack and learn the yogic techniques that people have learned for thousands of years so they can start to open up the channels in their body so they can handle these greater flows of energy. And a lot of the work I'm doing is helping is teaching people how to do that. <clears throat> they didn't learn that ahead. They're having to learn it now. You yeah. know, I know Aj and I both have a Zen background and he did right. a lot of sitting. And there's a real and also he's an athlete. You know, when somebody's mm -hmm. had a lot of physical training like that, their body can be much more finely tuned to opening up energies and much more conscious. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> many, many people are having to learn to really em become embodied, I would say. Oh, that's great. I mean, and I hear that word more and more. I think it's kind of catching on. People are realizing that that's necessary because there have been a lot of voices out there that have just sort of de-emphasize that or, or trivialized it and said you don't need it and, and it's just a concession with duality or, or whatever to do you know this practice or that physical therapy or whatever. It doesn't, uh, have, it doesn't have to be. No. It doesn't have to, it doesn't have to uh, be a concession with duality at all. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I think it's good for people to hear this and uh, not to feel ashamed of you know going ahead and engaging in this that or the other thing that may be helpful to them and there's a whole potpourri of things they could they could do and we don't need to even get into specific ones you'll kind of follow your heart and find the right thing I agree you know well many years ago when the Dalai Lama first came to the United States I was probably in my 20s I think I don't remember but a number he he wasn't you know as well known as he mm -hmm. obviously is now and a group of us went over to see him in Berkeley at, a, I think, the Nyingma Center, which was a Tibetan center. There weren't that many people there. It was a small gathering. And he gave a little talk. And I thought he was great. And he said, um, he goes, you know, in the West here, he goes, you have many things that can help you. He goes, you should take advantage of as much as you can because you need all the help you can get. <laughs> and I thought, I like, I like this guy. Yeah. Because, you know, I knew people that were like, you know, Zazen Uber Alles, you know. Right, right. If you did anything else, you were some heretic, basically. Yeah. And I thought, you know, argue for your limitations and they're yours, you know, or mm -hmm. some people paint themselves into a corner and they have to learn yoga to live in the corner. And so <laughs> I just, <laughs> you know, I wasn't going to be limited by the practice I was doing, ever. Yeah. I mean, on the flip side, there's always usually a paradoxical opposite to anything. A person can become a dilettante and, and just kind of dabble here and dabble there and never get serious about that's, anything. That's a good point, too. And I think today with so many people running around teaching that people can often just sort of be, but like, can be skimming the surface. But like you were saying, when people are ready for the next thing, they're going to find it. Yeah. And when they're ready to real, when they're really ready, readiness moves them forward, not their belief that they're ready. <laughs> People often want to be ready, or they think they're ready, but like we're in control, 
like we're running this show? <laughs> I don't yeah. think so. So I think you're right that when when readiness is ready, we are guided to that which is really going to support us on the next level. Yeah, presuming we uh, understand that there are levels. I mean, some. Well, that, that's, that's another like, popular theme out there is that there aren't there, any levels, and that there, the whole idea of progress is a dirty word, and you should just give up the search and you're there. Um, but anyway. <laughs> you know, that's that's where language really you can see why the Zen guys didn't talk much. I mean I think in a lot of ways there's there's I think language can really become an obstacle on this path. And I think that um ultimately you have to be honest with yourself and really see what the truth of your experience is mm -hmm. and how you know, how how it's showing up for you. And are there any blind spots? You know, even in your so-called awakening, are you deluding yourself? Because <laughs> I think sometimes people really think they've attained something, and then they're rudely awakened that something is still going on there. So I, I think that there's a lot of love. I mean, I again, I I use standard language just because I don't want to get, I don't want to limit the way I speak. But I think we figure out in the way in our conversation, our dialogue any misunderstandings that may arise from using so-called subject-object relationship or dualistic language. Yeah, I don't, just because we change our language doesn't mean that our reality has changed. <laughs> no, heck no. <laughs> and if we're free, it doesn't matter if we use the word I. Yeah, I remember uh, when I was a the, when I was a teenager. The first time I ever did LSD, we were sitting around with friends, and and everybody was into this language. Like you, you wouldn't say, uh, you know, please pass the salt. You'd say ego to ego. Uh, would you know? Would you pass the salt? <laughs> As if to sort of make sure we knew what we were talking about. But <laughs> it was kind of silly. In fact, I. I interviewed a guy recently who said that you know he was with the Papaji crowd over in Lucknow, and and when they all came back, you know they were all talking that way. This person would like to go, you know, walk over there, and rather than just saying I want to walk over there, there there, there was an attempt to kind of use certain verbiage that would would somehow make you put you in a state or something. But it all seemed very to me, it all seems very kind of unnecessary and unnatural. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what that is. I mean, I don't. I think that my my sense is that when things drop away, you don't have any rules anymore. Mm. It's just now you're not operating out of some belief or identity about how it should be. What's your whole take on uh, the whole idea of speaking of the word identity of personal identity? I mean, some people say that if you're really there, you know, really awakened to the nth degree, that there isn't going to be any sense of personal identity left. It's, uh, and I, always, I, I never understand how that could be possible, but I, I give them the benefit of the doubt because I don't claim to have reached the nth degree. But, <laughs> you know, I sort of feel like there's, there's got to be some modicum of personal identity or you wouldn't be able to function. Um, what's your take on that whole You know, thing? I don't, I don't, I don't, you, I don't use that way of describing what I experience or what's mm -hmm. happening. Um, so I can't really speak to those people. Um, okay. and I really don't know what else to say about it. But you know, in I, your I, own... I, I guess there's a sense of that there isn't... Yeah, I guess maybe that's already true for me. I just don't even think about it, actually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think it's that's been going on for so long. It's just not... Yeah. It's just not... I don't even I don't even talk about it or think about it. I guess that's probably more like it. But, but I think uh, in a way it's what I was saying about teaching. I don't I don't have a sense that I'm there there it isn't John, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That's not what's happening. But at the very same time is there a sense of John? I mean, it isn't and it is. I mean, both, you know, paradoxically one and, and the other together. I mean, there's John who has his problems with his eyes and who might have this health problem or this financial issue or, you know, who fell down and on the sidewalk. I heard you tell that story. And, I mean, there's, there's an, to, to, a, 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 to observers at least, there's an apparent person to whom these things are happening. From the inside, what's the perspective? Yeah, when I fell down, it was interesting. All of a sudden, it was—it wasn't like I even fell down. It was like the sidewalk came up to meet me. It was really interesting. <laughs> <laughs> and and then I had to give a talk for I don't know a hundred people or something like ten minutes later, and I would you know had been injured, and I just had eye surgery. You know, it was just the next thing. I mean, I think that it isn't it isn't about. <clears throat> I'm not living in the story of John. Let's mm -hmm. put it that way. So that's not happening. 
even when I, I don't know if you know, but I, I lost my life savings in uh, the Bernard Madoff scandal. Oh, I'll be darned. I didn't and know then, that. And then two months later, I found out I had might go blind. And so, and people who knew me thought, you know, I was because I was functioning at a pretty high level. And uh, we're like, wow, you really walk the walk, don't you? You know, you're not just mm -hmm. talking the talk. And I, I wasn't identified. I never had the story. I lost all my money. I lost my life savings. It wasn't like, why me? That didn't, that never happened. The only question that ever arose in that was, how could somebody do this? Yeah. That was the question I had. And, of course, I had to make some changes. You know, I had to re reorganize. I had to get into action, which happened immediately. I went into mm -hmm. action immediately. And... Um, but you know, I think that we, it isn't that we don't have human experience, it's not that if a friend of mine dies, I don't cry. Right. You know, I'm a human being, I have feelings. Mm -hmm. We all have, I mean, human feelings are part of our humanity, aren't they? Do we become free of our humanity? I, does it mean we don't have, we don't taste food anymore? <laughs> we don't enjoy the flavor of food? Or if we eat something rotten, we're not going to know it and take it out of our mouth? It's I guess like, people would say, well, tasting happens, you know, but okay. there's no well, person, who, there's that's no one it. who tastes. So I don't, so I don't, yeah, I mean, I think that when you're aligned with awareness, you know you are that. It isn't, I think there's a big emphasis on this loss of, I mean, I think the realization of that is, I guess, what the Buddhists have said forever is that there's no self. That's all mm -hmm. they're talking about. There's no personal self. Yeah, that's my experience. That's my experience. Right. I mean, you can't talk about it. It's 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 actually it it's sort of a catch twenty two to even talk about it. Yeah. You know, if you were in the Zen monastery right now, they'd hit you on the head with a stick. For talking too much. <laughs> For talking about it. <laughs> Just go wash your bowl. Yeah. Uh, I guess I, I won't try to conduct interviews in Zen monasteries. You know, Punjaji, I, I spent six, he, inv he invited me to come to Lucknow mm -hmm. and wrote me a wonderful letter back in 1990, I think, and I went and spent about six weeks with him and loved him mm -hmm. and had a wonderful time with him. And he was very real. He was just a beautiful, radiant being, joyful. And, I, you know, he, I don't know, I, he, uh, he, he felt pretty natural to me. Yeah. You know, I had dinner at his house and put a, his arm around me and we'd laugh our heads off about stuff and... You know, and, you know, I remember he would look at everybody and go, you are my children, you are all my children, you know, like that. And, you know, he's just, he was really loving. He was incredibly loving, very affectionate. How did and, he know uh, about you to write you a letter? I wrote him a letter. Oh, I wrote I him, I was interested in coming and seeing him, interested in meeting him. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, he wrote me back and said, you know, can I have the letter? And it's my handwritten letter, nice. And I went and spent about six weeks with him. And then when I was leaving, I was in his room, I said, well, I'm... I'm going back to San Francisco, and he goes, so soon? <laughs> so soon? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he was wonderful. You know, he's very loving, and, you know, he's, man, you know, we're all human beings. Come on. Yeah, some of us are really radiant and really loving, and, I mean, isn't, I mean, my question would be, are you real? Are you realizing that what this what this life is really about is being fully human, is being able to f realize we are connected, so that there's love and connection? I mean, if if we're not discovering that, what are we doing? No, that's all great. Um, you know it's just mean? that there is a lot of emphasis in spiritual circles about there being no person, you know. And so, I think it may confu it may clear be a great clarification for some people, but it might also be a source of confusion for some people because people feel like, well, I feel like there's a person, you know. I I'd feel bad if I lost my life savings or if I, you know, injured myself in some way. There's there there seems to be a me to whom things are still happening, you know. And so, when people hear this talk of there being no person, it can be a bit perplexing. Yeah, I don't know how useful that whole discussion is for most mm -hmm. people. I don't go there because mm -hmm. I think it's. I think it. I think you're right. I think if anything, it produces more confusion than is necessary. Truth is, the what we are fundamentally is already free, right. and when we're aligned with that, that's what's happening. Yeah. And so, if, if again, otherwise it becomes another, like. Uh, anticipation or another expectation to not be somebody. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like it becomes another identity of not being anybody. It's sort of ironic, but um, I don't. I think that when when freedom is when one is really aligned with that, I guess you could say, yeah, there's no personal identity functioning. It's not the same anyway. It's a different perspective. Yeah. I think fundamentally, it's the shift. It's not that one doesn't know that there's a personality there. That's just an imprint. 
right. or an ego or something. There's a certain dynamic that we're basically constructed as that just functions. It's a function, mm -hmm. right? But when what the shift uh, is when we realize we are that, mm -hmm. and I would say that's the end of thinking that you're separate. Yeah. I'm not saying that you still don't have separate experiences. You may still. There may still be a, a, a sum of a, of a healing process going on, as we've talked about. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that clarifies it. I think it helps. I mean, could you say it this way, that, that it's a matter of where the predominant orientation is? I mean, if, if the predominant orientation is, I am a wave, uh, and that's all I am, then that's one thing. If the predominant orientation is, I am this ocean, and then I also happen to be this little wave, uh, you know, which is part of this ocean. Then yeah, I would say there's an absence of even the thought, I am anything. Yeah, I'm just I don't trying to think the thought, put it in I words. Am, I, to me, it never occurs. Mm -hmm. The I am thought never happens, period. Right. It just isn't there. Yeah. So it, it's just being aware. I mean, with, but if I'm sitting here having, you know, sort of having to describe what's happening, awareness and, you know, there's sounds sensations, imagery, energy, <clears throat> vibration. Feelings. It's, yeah, I could describe it in some way, uh, you know, or we may be sitting here together and even though you're where you are across the country and I'm here, you know, as we listen in a certain way, we actually can feel the connection mm -hmm. and that it's palpable. Um, you know, I, we, we are that, I would say. But again, there isn't a sense of like if I'm riding my bicycle or driving my car or out and up in front of a group of people, so to speak, there is there's no self consciousness. Right. There just isn't. That's not happening. Mm -hmm. That's just not there. Yeah, and when the let's say when the Bernie Madoff thing happened, there was probably a wave of feeling of yeah, this sucks, but it. Well, I just, call, I just called me the next day and said, man, it must feel like you got hit by a truck, hit by a train. <laughs> I go, yeah. I said, you know, there's a lot of money going out all of a sudden and none coming in. Yeah. And I thought, you know, I thought there was, you know, income. And it was, you know, it was it was definitely, uh, it was viscerally pretty intense. Mm -hmm. And I, I had a wonderful retreat place in the country in Bolinas that I had to let go of that I'd had for a few years. And, you mm -hmm. know, I had to make some changes. But, hey. <laughs> yeah. Life guides us to the next step, whatever that is, right? And we don't really know. You know, at any moment this this little this little dance we're in is over, right? Mm -hmm. For everybody. Yep. It's uh um uh, what's something I wrote hold on something. I wrote something down that I wanted to Oh, where did I put it? <laughs> oh, that's different. Okay, never mind. Sorry, I was kinda of... What is it? Do you remember? Oh yeah, well it was, you know, it was at, you know, when this life that we're living, it's like, what are we doing? It's like I said, you know, I was talking about the to-do list, like it, you know, like does it ever end? You know, can you are you ever going to get everything done? And so the question that I had was, does the to-do list disappear after you're dead? You know, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like when are you going to get it done? I often I've thought about that from time to time. Like you have all these things you got to do, and what if I were to, what if this would be my last breath? What would happen to that whole list, and how? How significant would it be anymore? Well, I think awakening, really realizing your what we're talking about is freedom. I think that is that reality that even though there's an endless to-do list, you can only just be right here. You know, this is yeah. this is just what you can take care of, and you do the best you can. Mm -hmm. And some people might just sit around and do nothing, and other people might run a multinational corporation. Yeah, be head of a government. I mean, it's just, you know, it's not according to your dharma or something. I'm not going to indicate a particular lifestyle. It could be anybody, anywhere. There was a, speaking of Jean Klein, there was this woman named um, Suzanne Siegel who wrote a book wow, called... I was, really, I was really close to her. Oh, we cool, were, yeah, Collision of the in, with the Infinite. Yeah, yeah, that Stephen yeah. Bodie wrote that book about her. Yeah, and her little catchphrase was, uh, do the next obvious thing. You know, she she kept saying that. You know, she 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 went spent that ten years freaked out, not knowing, you know, f trying to find a personal self and not being able to. But she she just meanwhile raised a daughter and got a master's degree or something or PhD maybe. And but she kept saying throughout her book, "Do the next obvious thing." And I just kept doing the next obvious thing. 
which she is was a, in fear after that experience happened or she was in fear for 10 years yeah yeah of no self and um she came to see jean klein actually it was there that night she got oh, up cool. and talked to him and then she had a shift and mm -hmm. we actually became quite close and interestingly enough she and she tragically died you know at the age brain of cancer the yeah 40 of a brain to tumor. tumor yeah but um she actually interesting enough went back into fear before she huh. died which which was very interesting and i i mean i think that the but this is and i don't think it means anything i think that the body is just a separate dynamic from the sort of realization that we are this as she used to use the word vastness which i like a lot mm -hmm. too. i like that too yeah and but she was wonderful i love suzanne and and that was a real that was a real loss that she yeah. passed away. Well, you know, I mean, the changes taking place in her brain, a result of that, could easily trigger the fear. I mean, yeah. any one of us, take yourself, take Adyashanti, inject you with the right <laughs> chemicals, and who knows what would happen? You know, there could be a right. huge, <laughs> you know, because we we are living this through through a nervous system. Yeah. 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 So. Yeah. Interesting. So. Uh, What haven't we covered? Um, we've been sort of we've been, we've been going through a kind of a chronology of teachers you've been with and this and that and stages of realization. I mean, uh, have there been any? Is there anything else? Uh, you know, any milestones that you haven't really mentioned that you want to touch upon? <laughs> I'd have to think about that. I don't know. Oh, uh, maybe there aren't. If, if because those idea. those several big ones stand out in your memory as having. Yeah, those been, are the. I would say in terms of significant shifts those were pretty significant i mean i th i don't know i mean i'm learning all the time i'm yeah. discovering and i i'm i feel like learning is happening all the time and it's awesome mm -hmm. totally awesome and i think that's the i think that uh you know the purpose of our life is to become fully alive and awakening is part of becoming fully alive I don't think it's the transcendence of being human. We'll be transcending humans soon enough. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like, why push it? You know, I'm like, what's the point of being here if it isn't about to be fully alive? And so I think that's, I, I'm discovering life all the time, and I'm learning as a human being all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and, I'm, and I'm very grateful and appreciative of, you know, the wonderful people around me and, and the love and and the discovery that we're all having together just i just led a retreat last weekend and it's amazing what's happening with people phenomenal mm, yeah. phenomenal healing and transformation and and it's just it's such a it's such a honor and privilege to be a part of that just to be a part of that discovery and i'm so grateful that sort of you know what i've devoted my life to really has uh is actually uh, helping other people i mean i don't have that sense of that you know i don't have an identity about that but it's clearly I'm seeing that so much, and I'm just thinking, wow. You know, a friend of mine who's very pragmatic, I wouldn't really call him a spiritual person. So he's been coming on the retreats for years and very observant. And he said, wow, it's just amazing to see people come back on these retreats and how much they've changed. He goes, this really works, <laughs> you know? And so that's, that. I, I'm, I think for me, because maybe because we grew up in the 60s and, you know, we had a strong sense of social responsibility and wanting to help and wanting to make a better place for, for us to live. You know, it's just great to see that, you know, that, you know, if we're bringing more light into the world, that's a good thing. Yeah, I, th I agree. And uh, I, I've enjoyed listening to your podcast and sort of okay. hear, hearing the, you know, the, the expressions of appreciation and growth that the people were giving. Um, it's obviously been quite profound for many people. Uh, do you have, a, uh, do you actually yourself have any sort of formal spiritual practice that you engage in, or you just get up in the morning and brush your teeth and go about your day, and that's that's your spiritual practice? Well, I used to, no, I don't have any formal practice. I mean, I did obviously for decades. Yeah. No, I mean, I just you know this morning, I don't know, I was making the bed and I sat down and just kind of was being vastness for you know just kind of enjoying that and then mm -hmm. got up and continued making the bed. I mean, it's not. It isn't, uh, I mean, it was lovely to go on a retreat because there's silent sitting retreat. It's one of the few times where I actually get to <laughs> sit <Yeah>. around. <laughs> <laughs> but I love, I mean, I love going out to nature. I think, I think being in nature is one of my greatest yeah. pleasures, really. It's just being at the ocean or in the redwoods and just, you know, that's such a wonderful, wonderful thing. Or I love hiking and bicycling and, mm. you know. Um, being with friends, but as far as a formal, I've I have a you know I have a lot of tools in my toolbox. Right. 
you know, and I and and sometimes maybe I do just sit, you know, depending on what's going on. And I, obviously, I'm working with people. I see people privately, and I'm working with people eight hours a day, and I'm sitting with people eight hours a day. So wow, you mean you're that busy with people? Eight oh hours yeah, a day? that's yeah, amazing. I am busy, and then I'm teaching publicly too. So I've got various yeah. public gatherings. I'm very busy. I barely have time to go to the you know post office, huh. and uh, so it's. It's um, so I guess that maybe my maybe my spiritual practice is just being with other people right now. <laughs> Sounds like it to me. I mean, it, it, it's it's cool. You know, you, you have your attention on this process all the time with all those people. And, pretty much. Yeah. Pretty much. You know, and it's really, um, you know, it's just being a mirror. Yeah. That's all it is. I don't really see it as anything other than and, and pointing out. You know, in terms of in terms of what I really see a lot of what I'm what my role is, if you will, is really pointing out what I call the blind spot. Mm -hmm. And that's where, you know, people are very focused on what they don't want, the object of what they don't want, or they're very focused on the object of what they want. For example, they have fear coming up and they don't want it, or they don't want some kind of anxiety coming up. So they're very focused on that. But what they miss, ironically, is just the not wanting. Hmm. Because the fear or the anxiety, all that will just move naturally. It's just a river. We're just our emotions are just a river, you know, it's just a weather system that goes through us. So often they need just that mirror to bring attention to that, where that resistance is. That's the suffering. Suffering is just the resistance to what is. It's not what is. Whether it's losing right. all your money and going blind, whatever. That's not. That's just what's happening. Yeah. The story, the resistance to it, is the suffering. Huh. So it's not and like so. You know, so what they're missing is the fact that they're resisting or the fact yeah. that, the, yeah, that they're... The, the Buddha pointed that out 2,500 years ago. Mm -hmm. That's what he meant. That's when exactly... He, when he said what? Well, that the cause of, that the cause of suffering is clinging, ah, is, is yeah. greed, hate, and delusion, is wanting, not wanting, and trying to figure it out, is the way I put it. Right. Which is pretty much the same realization, so that when you can give it... So satsang, or even personal meetings, that what happens here is not like we sit down and figure out how you can get a better job, even though that might happen, right? But, you know, or take or heal your cancer or whatever it is, you know what I mean? Or or grieve the loss of your loved one. You know, mm -hmm. all the experiences that we go through as human beings, the huge range of experiences that we go through. But it's, um, you know, I've got myself on a mental track and I just lost all of it. It just went poof. That happens sometimes. You're saying it's not that we figure out the specific problems, but it's more like we get to the root of what it is. the resistance you. to allowing things to be as they are. I think what that's it is what that we offer the condition right. into the space of awareness. Mm -hmm. It isn't about figuring out how we're going to get from point A to B. It's that we just say, I don't know how to get from point A to B, and that construct, that dynamic is offered into the space and s s all of a sudden there's a shift yeah that's the miracle of satsang that's the miracle of really meeting in oneness it isn't that we figure it out mm -hmm. it's not that we do the next thing that's that's what that's the that's what it means to have non that's the direct method you follow me yeah it is not the it's it, it, it isn't that we fix something. It isn't that we figure it out. It isn't that we get rid of something. Mm -hmm. But that we fully bring it into the space of awareness and somehow miraculously the whole orientation to it shifts. Mm -hmm. That's the possibility. That's that's what happens in the offering. So satsang is really just an offering. And that mirror of awareness allows that cooking to take place. That tra It's like alchemy. It really is alchemy. And it's amazing. It's amazing, you know, that we that it's it's like the shackles of our resistance are removed, and all of a sudden our perception, our perspective of what's happening, completely can change. All of a sudden, we cannot be in struggle with it anymore. Hmm. And 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 so it's so important to be honest to say I am in struggle with it. Who cares? <laughs> Somebody like giving you a grade, oh, you're not very spiritual. Gee, you've been meditating for 30 years. You're still struggling? <laughs> like, <laughs> like, who cares? Yeah. And blame and shame and guilt. Drop all those. Useless. Mm. Or if they're functioning, notice that they're there. Yeah. I'm really ashamed. I've been meditating for 30 years, and I'm still struggling with what is. So? <laughs> At least you can tell the truth about it. That's a step. That's a yeah. That's what's important. Not that we struggle, but that we can be honest. Once you can be honest about it, you can be free of it. That's mm. the truth. When it's really expressed and offered in that space of awareness, 
It's amazing. It's a miracle, and I wa and I'm and I'm sitting there in awe all the time watching this happen, and it's incredible. That's great. So if you had to like summarize what happens in your satsangs, in your meetings, would you say that that's, that's the crux of it, that, that somehow it enables people to shift into a different style of functioning? Where yeah. I mean, awakening is just, that's the beginning. I mean, you know, people make a big deal about awakening. It's not a big deal. Right. People are having awakings all over the place. Most yeah. of them don't even know they're having them. <laughs> you know, Suzuki Roshi said practice begins with enlightenment. Mm-hmm. How would you know your? How could you find your way if you didn't know what you, who you fundamentally were? Now, some people claim that oh, when you discover that, it's the end of all of it. Well, sometimes it is, but I think for most people, it's it's really it's the beginning of the path, so to speak, of discovery. Yeah, maybe it's both. It's the how end of end of one phase, beginning of uh, an even more. How could the infinite have a beginning and an end? Right, right. That's absurd. <laughs> Maybe it's better to call it a milestone, but not. There's no yeah. beginning or end. Point. Maybe even the Buddhists have, you know, in the and in, in their and have have, met, have described many many levels of enlightenment and all mm -hmm. this. Yeah, I mean, how could there be an end to it? I'm sure. I'm I'm constantly. I'm, I'm. Who knows what discoveries will happen? How great that they can keep happening. I'm with you. I mean, I I love that orientation. That's that's the way I think of it. And and you know, I'm perplexed when people tell me that there's they've reached some static. Finality, and I think, well, I don't know. Okay, my, my only power. question. I only have one question for them. Uh huh. Do they believe that? They seem to. <laughs> yeah, um, well, that, yeah, but you know. But maybe they'll be question. pleasantly surprised. Isn't that a red flag that they believe? Yeah. I think being liberated, there isn't. There's really. You can't have a belief. Who can have a belief? Who's having a belief? In fact, it's it's like a stock question for me in these interviews. Usually towards the end, I say, "Okay, well, where do you see it going from here? You know, do you do you see some kind of unfoldment taking place, some refinement? You know, so and some people say yes, and I just said yes. I mean, good uh, for Ga him. That's yeah. Buddies. Gangaji said yes. Good. She, yep, um, I love, she's an old friend too, and I yep. love her. Yep, and in I fact, she uh, she actually alluded to Nisargadatta uh, more or less on his deathbed, having said, "Oh, uh, that, I am that." That was like kid stuff. I've uh, there, there's been so much more growth since then, you know. <laughs> you know people need to hear this. Let's take. Let's let's let's. Come on, guys, start showing your dirty laundry. Let's be honest. Yeah. <laughs> Stop trying to hold up some illusion. Yeah, get on. You know who believes this? This is the question. If somebody's got a belief, I think that's questionable. And what is the advantage of believing it? I mean, what is what are what does one gain? I mean, if it's true, fine, I'm all for it. But what does one gain by latching on to this attitude? Well, I think you just said it. Belief is all about security, and as long as there's mm. still the need for security, there's still somebody who's identified. That's the point. Huh. It's not possible to have a belief in freedom. It doesn't exist there. Yeah. Belief only exists in the ego, in the in the in the uh, in the organ in the organism's need to function and and, uh, and survive. Hmm. Otherwise, in, in the realm of awareness, it doesn't exist. It can't. Yeah. I mean, it, it can as a belief, but, well, it, a but if, if you don't calcify it, if it's like, yeah. okay, well, this is a perspective, but it's not like the absolute perspective, and who knows what, what might happen to it, then you know, that's the right orientation. Yeah, I, I have say. this perspective, but, I don't hold, but I'm, not hold on, I'm not holding on to it. Yeah. There's no security in it. It's not, it's not believed in the sense of I know. Mm -hmm. No, it's yeah. We could describe this this way right now. It's just, it's just, it's, it's, it's a useful form. There's a nice little verse or a nice little commentary in uh, the my teacher, my former teacher, Marshi Mahesh Yogi, in his commentary in the Gita. He defined humility as being the quality of not insisting that things happen any particular way. Perfect. And I, I would say you could say the same thing about belief, you know, not insisting that things are any particular way in, in a sort of a static, rigid kind of way. I know? agree. Yeah, yeah. I, I agree completely. You know, something that was really beautiful that Robert shared with me, Robert Adams, that mm -hmm. I don't know if you've heard this, but um, <clears throat> he said, you know, most people who become free um, are just ordinary people living ordinary lives. They don't become sages or saints or teachers, spiritual teachers, you know, they're not celebrities. They're just ordinary people living ordinary lives. And unless you are open, really open and awake, and unless you're hanging out with them over some time, you wouldn't even know it. Mm -hmm. And I thought, now isn't that right on? Yeah. Isn't that, be <laughs> isn't that beautiful? You know, and everyone has that within them. Everyone has that seed 
of discovery within them. Whether or not that's their journey this life, who knows? Yeah, yeah I have this friend here in my town who um, he's, he's an artist, a designer, but he works in a factory and you know he has a wife and, and two kids and um, he has the most extraordinary level of clarity of experience of anyone I've ever spoken to. I mean, just amazing stuff going on. He refuses to be interviewed. Just, just had his his business partner of 15 years doesn't have a clue that any of this is happening with him. He's just like this private person. But boy, what a what an inner life is, is yeah. being lived. <laughs> yeah, no, it's and and we all are really. And when you come from that place, you see everybody from that perspective. Yeah, everyone becomes Buddha, huh. actually whether they know it or not. That's a nice point too because there can be a kind of a, a spiritual haughtiness that one subtly may develop in terms of oh you know I've been on this path for so long and I'm so enlightened and and this this clerk in the grocery store here who you know he's but that kind I of would, added, I would turn run turn around and run as fast as possible if you see that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a giant red flag. Yeah. Huh. In my book. <laughs> So with your students, um, do you have like, a, a, aside from, they sit with you in a satsang, either personal or group, and then what do they do all week? I mean, do you have any kind of practice that you prescribe or anything from your toolkit, or, or is it more like, okay, I'll see you next week, and, uh, you know? Well, I would say that each individual in certain circumstances may very well benefit from certain kinds of feedback, mm -hmm. so I don't really make any, I don't make any general pronouncements at all. Yeah about what's appropriate for an individual. Okay. It really varies quite a bit, actually. Yeah. And, um, you know, and then I have people that are close to me who also come to my groups and we hang out just as friends. Mm -hmm. And then that's nice, right? And then there's, so it's, um, that, that's, that's, yeah, I would say that's very individually tailored. Yeah. But well, I, you know, it's interesting though, mm -hmm. Rick, in the groups too, you find that somebody will come up and they'll share what's going on and some very profound thing may happen with them. And that might affect a lot of people in the room. Yeah, yeah. That it actually, it's not just, you know, I tell people, it's not just the person up there, it's everyone that's up here. Even mm -hmm. the people listening to the podcast a month later. Mm -hmm. It's amazing that this, that what we're doing when it really has that intention is coming from that place of oneness. Actually, everyone is connected in. Yep. So, it, but it isn't like because one person may need to, you know. I again, I I, I hesitate even talking about that. But I, and I'm usually very specific if somebody, for instance, is uh, really has a lot of energy moving through them, but is very ungrounded, mm -hmm. and is having symptoms, physical symptoms as a result of that, even maybe not able able to function or be able to go to work. Yeah. Uh, then I'm going to very specifically work with them with various. Uh, ways of being aware in their body and their breath and so forth to help ground what's happening, to help open their channels. Or maybe they need to be in therapy mm -hmm. and do therapy and work with their psychological issues. That's very common. I know even I just referring people to therapy, which I was so glad to hear him do that. Because I think some people, you know, that this, of course, if it wasn't needed, it wouldn't be there. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I think, again, it's not like one-stop shopping. Some people want, well, I just want, you know... I just need more Shakti. That's all I need, and, and then I'll be enlightened. But I've seen people who've been on Shakti highs for 30 years all of a sudden have their whole life fall apart on them yep. and rudely awakened, like, what was I doing? Mm -hmm. They were attached to Shakti. Yeah. You know, it was great. Let's face it. It's a good drug. Um, but it's, you know, mostly it's just energy, and it's going, and if it's really understood deeply, it's like what Sri Aurobindo said. You really find out how to live this life. Mm -hmm. from the whole perspective of a human, which includes our divinity, which includes the vastness of no identity, and it includes the little me. Yeah. It includes the whole thing. Nothing's excluded, you know? Nothing's that's that's kind of what I was trying to get at before in terms of this discussion of me, no me, that kind of thing. It's like there's this whole package and uh, maybe the ratios are different for different people between the, the predominance of the of the me versus the vastness and so on but it's not really germane to to dwell on it in too much uh, but I know, tell I, people the proof's in the pudding 
yeah. they come to retreat and they have a major change, life change. I have people come with major life change. They have major changes happen, many actually. Mm-hmm. People who are like judges coming from the Midwest somewhere don't have, they don't even have this background. You mean and actual it, judges in courts, those kind yeah, of judges? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just saying people who have, you know, who have, you know, you know, all kinds of. They're not just on some spiritual path, right? Right. They're just, you know, they're they're grandma. They have children, grandchildren. Mm-hmm. You have, you know. And they come, and it's like their whole world shifts, and their and the life changes, and and it's like the proof's in the pudding. Yeah. It's like what's is is it working? My question is, is it working? Are you really living more fully? Are you mm-hmm. loving more fully? Are you forgiving yourself for being imperfect? You know, are you, you know, is it is is it really happening for you? Yeah. And that's and what I'm seeing is that it is, you know, and and it has and continues to. And we're and it, we're all and we're all in this together. Let's just be honest about. It. Let's just share notes. Mm-hmm. Let's not find. Let's not believe one person's right or somebody. I mean, you know. Let's face it. The spiritual identity has been the cause of a lot of suffering in in our human history. If you happen to remember the fire sign theater, which was oh, a I comic. do. Remember that we're all bozos on this bus. I sure do. In fact, they used to. They had another album called "How Can You Be in Two Places at Once When You're Nowhere at All." Yeah, I, I love them. I I used to go to the committee theater in San Francisco when I was a kid. I used to go. They were the another improv group, comedy group. Yeah, they were great. Yeah. They, in fact, the fire sign theater had a political group button, a political group they came up with for a while. Do you remember? It was not insane. <laughs> and a little political button that said, not insane. <laughs> That's a good one. Well, it kind, of, it kind of fascinates me because I've always been a, a technique kind of guy. You know, I mean, I learned to meditate when I was 18, and I still meditate a couple hours a day. Hey, and man. and I actually have people encouraging me to stop. They say, you've done enough. You know, you shouldn't med- bother meditating anymore. You know, so it could be, could be holding you back. But I just I don't feel like stopping. I, I, I personally find it very enjoyable, soothing, rejuvenating. It's a nice part of my day. I probably, if I weren't meditating a couple hours a day, I'd probably be sleeping a couple hours more. But... Uh, but it fascinates me to see the dynamic of your approach, and of course your approach has been similar to mine at times in your life, but where you have a group of people and they all just start popping like popcorn just because of the the collective consciousness that's taking place in that group, and they walk away with lives transformed. I mean, I've, I've been participants in that kind of thing myself, but it, it fascinates me to see that as a, pra- as a sort of a practice, uh, excuse the word, in and of itself, which is almost like sufficient unto itself. Uh, as it could a, be. It very well yeah. may be. I don't. I have no position on it at all. If somebody mm-hmm. wants to meditate all day long, fine. I don't. If they want to run or they do something else, I mean, again, it's like I'm more looking at. I'm always looking and seeing how it's working for them. Yeah. I don't have a position about it, and 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 one's approach could change as well. Sure, it could. Yeah. So, and I think that what I think what you want to develop, I think what I would, what I encourage people to develop is a flexible mind. Yes. A flexible attitude. If you don't have that, then you're in trouble. <laughs> yeah, I was just I was interviewed guy by a guy this morning that had a sort of a blog talk radio show, and and I was just making the point that you know look at it from God's perspective, you know, big universe. Lots of souls, many paths. I mean, if somebody wants to chant Hare Krishna or be an atheist or be a fundamentalist Christian or be a Mormon or whatever or be a yogi or this and that, there's there's such a huge diversity of life and, and everybody's doing the best they can. And if they become dissatisfied with what they're doing, they'll probably do something else. But, uh, you know... Just, well, sometimes uh, people break away from these. I mean, I'm working with somebody right now who's ber- breaking away from a very... Um, what can I say? I don't want Dogmatic. To say very, you know, very strict and very, um, you know, a tradition that is, I would say, you know, if you don't follow the rules, you're, you know. Going to hell or something. Big time. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and then to start to find your own truth and realize it's different than what, you know, a bunch of people are telling you or what you've been conditioned. That's a very powerful, you know, path. And, and I've worked with a number of people like this who, you know, were very afraid. Yeah, to really yeah. follow their truth because you know they're basically being you know excommunicated or they're considered heretics. Mm-hmm. And um, you know how long ago was it that people were burned at the stake or you know nailed on the cross yeah. for not going along with the uh, party the line? Yeah, not that long. So I think this is really where we have to be careful is about having any party line. You see, yeah. I think I think this is where beliefs have to be questioned. Absolutely. I think any belief that can't be questioned is questionable. 
<laughs> and that that and that pertains not only to the sort of um, blatantly fundamentalist types of groups, but also many contemporary spiritual groups, which oh, you, yeah. you and I may have belonged to or yeah, something. Imagine, yeah, some of the most dualistic people I know are non-dualists. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think it's you know again. It's we can poke fun, but we're all human. Let's face it, we're all yeah, human. yeah. And I think if we can look at ourselves honestly, really, and and be willing to be vulnerable as a human being, and really not be so what self-assured. I mean, mm. self-important. <laughs> that's maybe? not it. Not it. Sure isn't. Yeah. That's What's not, not it? The self-important or self-assured? Neither. Oh. Those aren't those aren't hallmarks of freedom. No, no, of course. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Yeah. No, I mean those are things that you want to question. And I, Correct. I, it's not the party line. It's not the. It's not being able to. It isn't about talking the talk. It really is about being it. Mm -hmm. And and being it is there is no identity in being it. That is for sure. Yeah. There's no Good. self. There's no self consciousness about being it. Well, I think we beat that point to death, <laughs> but I think it, it it bears a certain amount of it warrants a certain amount of emphasis and and exploration, you know, because there's so much of it going on, and and you know, I don't claim to be utterly um, non guilty of it myself. I mean, it's easy to sort of slip into it into those things, even subtly, you know, the subtle tendrils or remnants of of um, being stuck in in particular beliefs or attitudes, you know, having not questioned certain assumptions and and so on, and you you can always dig a little deeper and you know get a little clearer. People want the instant fix, you know. Yeah. It's sort of it's sort of human nature. Maybe it's the American way. You just want a pill. We just want the you know let give me the enlightenment pill. I don't want to I don't want to you know I don't have time to waste with this. Mm -hmm. But you know people want the instant fix, and anything that sort of promises a quick fix is going to be appealing. It's going to be appealing, but you know, let's face it: if the acorn became an oak tree overnight, we'd have a real problem. <laughs> we would. <laughs> yeah, the acorn takes some time, and maybe the, does the acorn sit around and go, "Gee, I wonder if I'm going to sprout. I wonder if I'm going to become an oak tree." But it's got the oak tree within it, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. It's got the oak tree nature there, and will that acorn become an oak tree? Who knows? Mm. And if it starts to sprout, it starts to make. How long is that? You know. I think a gradual evolution is probably more what's true for most people. And whether people need practices along the way or therapy or body work or mm -hmm. just whatever whatever they need, I'm sure, like you say, there's, they're going to find. And um, the nourishment that they need will come to them. And even, a, I mean, theoretically, at the age of 16, when you had that big flashy experience, you could have interpreted that as having been you know the 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 final deal you know oh i'm awake now i've had my enlightenment experience and uh you know but none but now it's been decades later and there's and even after that there's been this continual gradual sometimes not so gradual refinement and unfoldment and growth um so it's like they both can happen you know there there can be big breakthroughs and big ahas uh, but and there can also be gradual growth, yeah. and the the two go hand in hand paradoxically. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I didn't, you know, that um, I didn't even know what happened. You know, a friend yeah. of mine, I was sitting in class in high school, going into these profound states, hmm. and a friend of mine, a very close friend of mine, ended up in a mental hospital, and I got afraid. I thought, well, maybe I'm going crazy, so I actually hmm. blocked that from happening. I stopped it. Yeah. I actually blocked it. Who knows uh -huh. what would have, what would have happened if I hadn't? If I was if somebody had been around, who could mentor me, say, "Hey, you know, this is this is okay. Go with this." You know, I had no, I didn't even know what meditation was. I didn't know what enlightenment was. I didn't yeah. know any of that. And but I'll tell you that whatever opened then is still here today. Yeah. Whatever started guiding me then is guiding me right now. Mm -hmm. That has not changed. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? The very same element, very same f foundation. Is that's there. why they. That's but why there's they been say, so much growth. Uh, uh, in, in, at the That's, same time. I think it's why in Buddhism they say the beginning of the path, the middle of the path, and the end of the path is the same. That the fundamental realization of the glimpse of the truth is identical to the final 
um, you know, embodiment and becoming fully established in that truth. Mm. That is absolutely my experience. I'm glad we continued this interview long enough for you to say that because I heard you say that during one of your podcasts and I really liked that phrase and meant to bring it up. Uh, say it one more time if you would. The beginning of the path, you mean? Yeah, or yeah, that, that, that quote. Yeah. Well, that the beginning of the path, the middle of the path, and the end of the path is exactly the same thing. Mm -hmm. And that the realization of the truth, even the glimpse of the truth, is no, even if it's just a mini little glimpse, is, is no different than the ultimate full establishment in that truth. Yeah. And so whatever happens in between is what we discover, what we find, our healing process, all of it. It's yeah. all allowed. Everything is welcome. Everything is allowed. Nothing is excluded. Nothing. Uh -huh. How could anything be excluded from that? And when you say it's no different the end than the beginning, it doesn't mean that they are identical in terms of the, the, the maturation that has taken place, but in terms of the essential ingredient. I think it's what Buddha said is discovering the per that, that everything is changing except one's true nature, that that is the unchanging. That is yeah. the I am. Yeah. When the Sargadot say, I am that, that's what they're mm -hmm. talking about. Right. That the realization of that is what I'm talking about. Yep. But it's not a belief, obviously. No, it's a living reality, if you want to call it that. As, they, as that other quote, for those that know, no explanation is necessary. For those that don't know, no explanation is possible. <laughs> uh, good. Okay. Well, it's well, been a pleasure. pleasure yeah, I, with you, Rick. The, the way I my mind works, we could probably do this for the next three hours. But I, you know, I, at a certain point, I feel merciful and I feel all right. I better let this guy go. And I think my <laughs> bladder may need a break, <laughs> or it will, one or the other. <laughs> Good. So let let me make a quick wrap up point or two, and then we'll let you go. Um, so I've been speaking with uh, John Burney, and I will be linking with to John's website on mine, which is batgap.com, B-A-T-G-A-P, uh, and I'll also link to any books John has written and so on, so that you can conveniently find those. Um, this is this interview with John has been part of an ongoing series. There's a new one each week. Next week will be a fellow named Muji, who is also a Papaji student. Um, and uh, if you would like to be notified each time a new interview becomes available, you can either um, you know, subscribe on YouTube or you can go to batgap.com and sign up to receive an email each time a new interview be becomes available. There's also a little discussion group there on Batgap where um, you p various you know, people get involved in chatting about what was discussed in each interview, so you can do that if you'd like. And it's also available as a podcast, so um, as I've been listening to John's podcast, you can sign up and get this through iTunes and then put it on your iPod and listen to this while you're commuting to work whatever so thanks again for listening oh. watching thank you John very much I've really enjoyed this um, me too real pleasure Rick really yeah pleasure. maybe in a year or two from now since we're both kind of growth oriented guys we'll do it again and see what's what's unfolded by that'd then that'd be great anytime anytime yeah. so thanks and thanks to those who watched or listened and we'll see you next week okay take good care <laughs>